So uh, good morning, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to week five of our, our 12 week uh, virtual crop hour series. Uh, my name is Chris Graham and I'm an agronomist with South Coast State University. And today's session, um, I'll be the, the moderator, I guess. And, and we're gonna be discussing some, you know, I guess for the week, really, we've been discussing crops that are generally take up fewer acres across the state. And uh, yesterday and today, we'll be, we're talking about pulses and primarily field peas, but um, perhaps some of the others as well. And uh, we're gonna focus in on, on disease issues with two speakers today. The first is, is Audrey Kalau. Uh, Dr. Kalau is a plant pathologist at, at the uh, North Dakota State University Wilson Research Extension Center. And she obtained her, her BS at the University of Minnesota in 2007 and then worked for um, a few years in the commercial inoculant industry prior to entering um, graduate school. Uh, Dr. Kayla obtained her PhD from University of Min uh, Wisconsin where she studied uh, root nodulation and, and mycorrhiza fungi. And since starting at, at NDSU in 2015, she has led both basic and applied research programs on um, management of plant diseases in durum peas, lentils, chickpeas, and sugar beets. Uh, she currently leads the North Central IPM uh, Pulse Crop Working Group and initiated and oversees the Growing Pulse uh, Crops podcast, which I've listened to quite a bit and it, it's a really great podcast for those that are are interested really well 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 done lots of great information and, and uh well produced um following dr kayla i will have uh, ruth beck and most of you or many of you know her she's an agronomy field specialist here at sdsu uh, based in pier she's worked there since 2004 and um but been been involved with the pulse industry for much longer since the early 90s um, where she helped form the South Dakota Pulse Growers Association. Uh, she works on wheat, peas, sunflowers, and uh, various other crops focusing uh, in that's the central South Dakota. Um, she also works on no-till, soil health, and, and cover crop management. Um, she served as an advisor in, in an advisory capacity for the South Dakota No-Till Association and the Pulse Growers for over 20 years. So with that, um, Audrey, I'll let you uh, share your screen and, and get set up. And just while, while she's doing that, I, I just want to do a few housekeeping. Um, just as a reminder, the QR code will, will come up at the end of the, of the session. And um, I think most of you are familiar with this, but if you're, if you're not, that requires the CCA app that you can scan that code for your credits. And then, um, of course, with all these sessions, we've been inviting participants to stay on and, and um, following following the, the conclusion. And, and we have kind of a, a more open discussion that allows people to kind of follow up on, on things that were discussed within the presentations and also just bring up any additional topics of interest. So I um, invite you to stay on because it's really a, a nice time to, to discuss and, and delve into issues further. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Audrey. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna focus on the soil-borne diseases of field pea. Um, so these would be the organisms that are living below ground in the soil and attack the plant parts, um, the seed, the roots, and uh, the stem at the soil line. Um, and so a number of organisms cause uh, these types of diseases and um, the diseases can be referred to as damping off, uh, root rot, and we see some wilts as well. Um, so I wanted to just roughly group it by the types of organisms that we're dealing with. Um, it can be important to know that uh, just because some of your management techniques are going to depend on uh, what pathogen you're dealing with. Um, so when we think of seed rot and seedling blight, uh, also called damping off, uh, these are pathogens that will actually attack the seed. 
Um, and so then um, what you see is, uh, you know, interruptions in the stand, bare patches in the field. So that's what we call a, a seed rot. Um, and then your seedling blight or your damping off is when the plant dies shortly after emergence. So the, the plant susceptibility period is really right around the planting time and shortly after emergence. And we tend to see less problems, um, you know, as the plant makes it through that that time period. And so um, I'm going to talk about uh, Pythium species um, that reside in the soil and, and cause these uh, seed rot and damping off disorders. Uh, there are other pathogens that will contribute to that, you know, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium. Um, but the management tactics I'm going to talk about are really focused on, on managing those Pythium species. Um, and then next I'm going to delve into the root rots. Um, we've got, uh, again, there are other pathogens that can cause root rots. Um, you know, I've been part of multiple uh, root disease surveys on pulse crops in North Dakota. Um, and uh, what we typically see is a mixture of fusarium root rot and then a little bit of a Phantomyces root rot. So um, again, your management strategies are going to differ slightly for these these different pathogens. Um, so I want to kind of talk about them separately. Um, and when we talk about the root rot, uh, you know, this is when the, the organism attacks the root specifically. Um, and so, you know, you can get quite a lot of below ground, um, you know, root death uh, before you start to see the symptoms below ground. So, you know, the above ground tissue might look completely green and healthy, you know, in the early in the season. And then later on in the season, as the plant becomes stressed, you start to see these yellow patches in the field. And that's what the, the picture here I'm showing is, um, you know, you're seeing that above ground yellowing, um, usually uh, kind of as the plant's starting to form pods. So, um, you know, just because you're not seeing symptoms above ground uh, doesn't mean you don't have problems below ground. So I'm going to start off with the, the Pythium seed rot. Um, again, this organism does specifically attack the seed um, and can rot it. And so that in the picture, the big picture, the plant on the left is healthy and then all the other uh, uh, seeds look like they're covered in dirt. Um, they look that way because the, you know, the seed is turning to mush and so the dirt sticks to the seed. Um, some of these seedlings do, you know, put up a shoot, um, but you can see the stem is kind of watery brown um, and that's where you get your, your damping off. You might get a shoot pop up and then, and then it dies. Um, you can see it's kind of in more detail that, that seed rot uh, there in the smaller picture. So again, um, Pythium can cause uh, problems with, with stand and then um, what you see at a field level is these random pockets of poor emergence. Um, so this is a, a photo from the Palouse region on chickpeas. Chickpeas are, are really susceptible um, to this pathogen. Um, and you can just see in the field where you've got areas of poor emergence. Um, you know, of course, you can get other things that cause poor emergence, um, cutworms, for instance, um, or maybe you're dealing with some skips. So um, to diagnose this problem, you know, I would recommend that you go in there and, and try to dig it up, uh, confirm you do have seed there, um, you know, confirm you don't have the cut stems that we see with the cutworms. Um, and, and look for those symptoms I described before. Um, so some of the risk factors for Pythium. Um, Pythium is uh, part of a group of organisms called Omycetes. Um, so they're kind of like fungi, but they're, they're a little bit different. They're their own group. Um, and uh, they tend to like wet conditions. Um, so at planting, when the seed's going into wet, really wet ground, um, and uh, when you're planting early and that ground is cold. So Pythium likes cold, wet conditions. Um, you know, areas of compaction tend to see it worse just because the plants are, are stressed there. Um, and uh, seed vigor is a really a big issue for this one. Um, you know, cracked seed coats, um, poor seed vigor, uh, seed that uh, is colonized with other microorganisms, pathogenic microorganisms, 
are, are going to put the plant at a disadvantage and you know pathogens always like to attack the unhappy unhealthy plant it's an easier target um, and so uh, I if you're if you're concerned about you know organisms that might be found on your seed there are resources that you can uh, send seed to, to to find out what you're dealing with um, this regional pulse crops diagnostic lab at Montana State University offers that service so you can you can send them their seed and they can tell you what are the different microorganisms that are on your seed. Um, I like to talk about Pythium uh, in terms of the soil borne diseases because that's where I have some actual good news <laughs> to deliver in that um, seed treatments can be highly effective for managing this pathogen. Um, like I said, it attacks you know, near the planting time and that's when uh, the concentration of the, the active ingredients are really high in the plant and of course on the seed surface. Um, and so in terms of timing, it works out for Pythium. And then we also have active ingredients that are effective against this organism. So it is an omycete. So, you know, you need to select the products that contain these specific ingredients that I list here. So methanoxum, metalaxyl have been around for a long time um, and they're, they're effective at managing Pythium. Uh, however, we have seen some circumstances of resistance uh, to these ingredients pop up in the Palouse pulse growing region. Um, they've seen uh, failures. And so um, a newer ingredient at the boxum, I know we are able to use that in North Dakota recently. Um, that's just been in the past few years. You'll want to check in South Dakota um, if you're able to use this. Um, it, the commercial name of the product is Integra Solo. I believe they're packaging it with other seed treats now. Um, but ethoboxum is also effective against pythium. And so, you know, in an ideal uh, circumstance where you're, you're really managing your resistance, um, you'd combine those just to prevent um, the soil populations in your region from um, becoming resistant to um, the methanoxum and metalaxyl. Um, those are really common seed treat ingredients. So, so that's the good news on, on Pythium. We are able to manage it. Just make sure that you're, you're selecting a seed treat that contains one of these products. All right, so, so moving on to a less tractable pathogen, um, a Phanomyces root rot. Um, we, have, we have documented this pathogen in North Dakota. It's present in Montana as well. Um, and it's been causing problems in, for many years in uh, Canada, where they've been growing pulses for, for a much longer time. Um, that looks a little bit different uh, from the Pythium. This is a, a picture. The healthy roots are on the left. The diseased roots are on the right. Um, so what's really characteristic of the Aphanomyces is this honey, uh, honey color, uh, golden brown. Um, you can see it's affecting uh, the stem as well as the roots. Um, as this disease progresses, um, you know, of course, these are these are greenhouse pictures. Um, plants in the field are usually attacked by other organisms simultaneously, so the, the symptoms might present differently uh, if you were to suspect this problem in the field. But um, if you get early infection and that's really your main problem, um, that's how you could distinguish it from your other root diseases. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of what it can look like um, in a field. Uh, this is a, a picture a grower sent to me uh, that was taken by a drone. Um, we did later sample some of his fields. Um, these are lentils actually, and confirm that a phanomyces was there. Um, I recommend you listen to episode eight of the Growing Pulse Crops podcast. This grower talks about the problems that he's had with root rots on his farm. Um, again, you can see those, that honey, golden brown discoloration on the stem and the roots. Um, and then the pattern in the field tends to follow, you know, low lying areas where the plants are stressed due to being waterlogged. Um, a phanomyces is also an omycete. So it's a water loving uh, pathogen. The, the water can facilitate infection. Um, and so, you know, the more uh, soil moisture there is, the more plants can be infected. 
Um, and then you can see it kind of following where water moves to the field, uh, field edges where there's more issues of compaction. Um, so, it, you know, in the very lowest line area of that, um, you know, maybe it's a, a field depression, um, the plants are dying due to just saturated, saturated soils. Um, but then as you get to the outer ring of that, you're going to see more root disease. Um, so this is why we're really concerned about the aphanomyces. Um, it produces these O spores. So this is a plant root. This is a close up of the O spore. For O mycetes, the O spore is the resting structure. Um, and this allows the organism to persist in the soil for 10 years um, or more. And so once you have a field that is heavily infested with phanomyces, it can be very difficult to produce peas or any other crop that is susceptible. Um, and so really the strategy with this pathogen is avoidance and we, we do that through crop rotation. We really don't have um, many other tools to manage this pathogen. Um, so uh, the affected crops are your lentils, peas, um, alfalfa in a race specific manner. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, vetches, sweet clover, uh, dry bean. Um, you know, we have not had success with releasing a commercial cultivar of peas or lentils who, that are resistant. Um, so that's not available. There are some lines where they've identified some resistance, but that's just been really challenging to, um, you know, get into a, a seed or a variety that you'd want to grow, that, the commercial variety. So um, we don't have that tool at the moment. Um, but not affected are, are chickpeas, uh, soybeans, fava bean has been more successful in terms of generating resistant varieties. So make sure you check your varietal resistance if you're a fava bean grower. Um, so then, you know, if you, we recommend a four year rotation with peas or lentils to um, avoid the buildup of these O spores in the soil. Um, so a pea durum lentil durum rotation is not a four year rotation because both peas and lentils are susceptible. Um, you know, that's a type of rotation we've seen for many, many years um, in our area of North Dakota. And um, that's what's uh, put some growers in trouble. Um, you know, if you want to put soybean uh, where I have that lentil or, or chickpea, we've seen a lot of success with chickpea in um, our area. The state is very, very dry. Chickpea is well adapted to uh, semi-arid climates. Um, you know, that will be a, a four-year rotation for a fan Um So I wanted to just talk uh, briefly about um, you know, the varieties of, of, well, not varieties, but the genetic diversity of the pathogen. So just because, you know, you've got this aphanomyces pathogen, it's actually um, within that uh, aphanomyces eutyche species, there's still a degree of um, genetic diversity. And in terms of alfalfa production, uh, it's in a race specific manner. So they have races one and two of uh, aphanomyces eutyches and, um, this diagram is just showing the plus it means it causes disease and this would be plus is that isolate or that pathogen causes disease and if it's a if a negative it means it doesn't cause disease and so alfalfa race one um, you know it causes disease on alfalfa that's susceptible to race one there are alfalfa varieties that are a resistance to race one it, it will also cause disease on your beans and your peas um, your, your susceptible beans and peas. Uh, race two, however, you know, it's going to cause disease on your susceptible alfalfa varieties. Uh, again, there is some race two resistant varieties out there. Um, it's not going to cause disease on peas. So these are experiments that have been done in the lab with these different aphanomyces isolates. So there is a little bit of um, diversity within the aphanomyces. Uh, meaning that it's more or less aggressive on different types of crops. Um, if you're an alfalfa producer and you're growing uh, peas as well, um, the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic at the University of Wisconsin, they do have an aphanomyces soil analysis assay um, that they determine uh, what races are present in terms of races one or two. Um, these are the instructions they provide and the cost. I would recommend that you get in touch with them 
if you're interested um, in this assay and this service um, at this email address. There's still, they've still got a lot of COVID restrictions in place, so they're dealing with less samples now. But um, if you're interested in that service, I just recommend going ahead and emailing them about it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you do, you, you can do some, some soil testing. Um, we have uh, limited abilities to do that in the US. Um, I, I mentioned that testing service at, at the UW um, Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. Uh, soil testing is much more widely available in Canada. Um, and what they do is they take the soil and um, they can actually measure the, the DNA of the pathogen in the soil. Um, and the current recommendations coming out of Canada is that you use that as a tool for making your field selections for where you're going to plant peas or lentils. So if you don't detect the aphanomyces, uh, you stick with your four-year rotation, but where you detect aphanomyces, you need a longer rotation. Uh, they recommend six to eight years, and that's because of these old spores, right? They, they last a really long time, but a percentage of them is going to become non-viable over the years. Just like seed, the oospores kind of lose viability with time. So you're just trying to give more time for the oospores um, to lose viability, reducing the amount of pathogen in the soil uh, so you can generate a healthy crop or you know, profitably produce peas. Um, and so I did uh, contact some of the, the labs in Canada. Uh, these two that I list here said they would be open to obtaining uh, the necessary permits to uh, accept soil samples from the US. Um, and so if you're interested in, in the soil testing, you can reach out to them about uh, submitting samples for Phanomyces soil testing, that, that DNA assay. Um, you can also test some of the soil on your own. Um, if, you're, if you're concerned about you know, getting root disease the next year in your crop, um, some research out, out from Montana State University, they, they took samples from different areas of the field to try to find um, where you're most likely to find the phanomyces, you know, so you don't have to um, you know, take a, a representative sample of the whole field. If you're just trying to find whether you've got it or not, um, the areas where you're most likely to find it are the field entrance area um, where it's you know, compacted. You might also have soil moving into the field from equipment. Um, and then from those low areas. So uh, if you, you know, you consider the very center of a, maybe a low spot, a few feet away from that um, center is where you're most likely to find the aphanomyces, um, again, because it's a, it's a water loving pathogen. Um, stick to the top six inches. Um, and then if you want to do like an at home bioassay, just, just take that soil and plant some untreated um, peas into it. And within a few weeks, uh, if you dig those up, you should be able to see the symptoms. So we do something similar in our lab to measure the, the uh, essentially the potential for the soil to result in root disease. And it takes about three weeks. And then when you, when you dig up the plants, you, you can tell if they're, they're black or, or brown uh, versus being the, the white that they should be. Um, the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers put out a field selection guide, um, and this identifies kind of your top risk factors for whether you're going to have problems with aphanomyces or not um, to help you select the best field site for growing your pulse crops this year. Um, so they put right at the top of the list the soil test. So they view that as, as really important to guiding your crop rotation strategy with peas and lentils. Um, and then second on that list is the environment the last time the peas or lentils was grown. So was it uh, above average moisture? So that would be maybe a 2011 type of year, or was it very dry? Um, fields going into peas this year um, that were pulses in, in 2017 when we had a drought, um, that would probably put you at a less um, risk scenario than um, where it was really wet particularly if it was really wet in the springtime, uh, right up around planting. 
Um, and then did you see symptoms the last time you had peas in the field? Did you observe, you know, the patchy to the whole field affected? And that's that above ground yellowing that I showed before or above ground, there's no symptoms at all. So uh, when you start to really get a lot of pathogen in the field, you'll see it above ground uh, more so than when you have lower uh, pathogen densities. Um, and then it just guides uh, your decision factors based on that. So there are some tools in terms of selecting fields specifically for PO lentil production. And I, I put the website there at the top of the screen. So this is an example of, of why planting into a field that, that was um, you know, saturated or, or really wet the, the last time you had peas is, is not a good idea. Um, so this is a field in North Dakota. Uh, these, these pictures were supplied to me by a Dr. Julie Pashi. She's a pulse pathologist, well, former pulse pathologist at NDSU, now a potato pathologist. Um, but these pictures are from two halves of the same field. Um, the one half, uh, they, they managed to get the peas in, in a really, really wet spring, and then the other half, they weren't able to plant. And so the other half of the field did not get planted to peas. And this is the, the pea, symptoms of the peas the next time that they planted peas in that field. Um, and where they had managed to get the peas in the ground, um, that's the, you know, the, essentially the, the completely dead plants on the right here. You know, above ground, it's, it's completely necrotic. And below ground, I, I don't think there would be a root system at all. And where they didn't plant peas in that wet year, it's completely healthy. So that's just one year of uh, poor environmental conditions. Um, you know, aphanomyces is, is, is present in the soil. It's just the cultivation, repeated cultivation of the peas or lentils that turn, you know, make it really a problem. So, um, so just one year can really blow up the disease if it's a really, really wet year. Um, in terms of management, uh, so I, I mentioned that that ethoboxum before. Uh, again, this is a relatively new product, which is commercially available. Um, the metalaxyl and methanoxum are not effective for aphanomyces, um, but ethoboxum does have some activity. Um, the difference between pythium and aphanomyces um, is that aphanomyces can continue to infect and cause severe root rot season long. Um, Pythium is really focused in that first part of the season and the plant becomes less susceptible as it ages. Um, so because of that, seed treatments are going to be less effective, um, but they do, they do still have some activity. So this is data from Michael Vunch. He's a, a plant pathologist at the Carrington Research Extension Center with NDSU. Um, and he's comparing um, three different seed treatments. So the base seed treatment is a product called um, Evergall Energy. Um, that would be uh, controlling your Rhizoctonia uh, fusarium, the, the true fungi, um, and then a gaucho, which is a insecticide seed treatment. Uh, so he refers to that as the base seed treatment, and then Intego Solo plus that base seed treatment at two different rates. So the 0 0.2 fluid ounces per 100 weight or 0 0.3 fluid ounces per 100 weight. Um, and if you look at the, you know, the plant, uh, Plant population, uh, root rot severity, um, no effect on that. Um, but he did he did see an end effect on the yield, but it was you know to a small degree. Typically, with with seed treatments, um, you see the greatest effect um, obviously where you have the most disease pressure. I would say this is pretty decent disease pressure, um, but uh, maybe it's it's getting to that point where it's too severe. Um, and uh, difficult to control because again, you're getting infection season long. So um, there are some, some tools in terms of the seed treatment, but I wouldn't expect it to be a rescue treatment. Um, <clears throat> so again, just to reiterate with the aphanomyces, um, you know, we don't have genetic resistance um, and seed treatments have limited efficacy. So you're going to want to plan a long-term crop rotation strategy that's going to reduce the amount of aphanomyces in your fields. All right, so uh, last on the list, fusarium root rot. Um, so this is uh, an example of, of what it can look like um, 
pretty similar uh, at, at low disease severity to what a phantomyces would look like in a field. Um, again, in the low lying areas where you have compaction and then where water travels through the field. Um, again, uh, it, it infects the roots, causes below ground um, root necrosis or blackening. And then above ground, once the plant becomes stressed later on in the season, you'll see the yellowing. And it can get quite severe um, where unmanaged um, and where it is, is affecting large areas of the field. So this is where, you know, maybe it's starting to become an issue and this is where it's definitely become an issue and growing pulses is going to be um, a challenge at that point. Um, so this is a, a picture of what kind of the, the early symptoms of fusarium root rot would be. So it starts at that seed attachment site and it's really this black, dark black, brown black um, symptom, uh, travels down the tap root and then starts to infect the lateral roots. Um, so that, that's what it looks like below ground. Um, and in this case, there are multiple species of fusarium that can cause this um, issue. Again, uh, surveys of field pea in North Dakota have found up to eight different fusarium species that are associated with these symptoms. Um, but most commonly, uh, what we found in these surveys are the avanaceum, fusarium avanaceum. Uh, that's considered one of the uh, biggest fusarium pathogens or most common fusarium pathogens to cause root rot on pea in North Dakota and Canada. Um, and Fusarium oxysporum has been associated with this, this disease as well. Um, interestingly, we, we've been noticing a lot of Fusarium graminiarum um, being isolated out of these, these disease pea roots. Um, and um, that is the causal agent of head scab in wheat. Um, you know, a lot of our rotations are, uh, you know, barley, durum, wheat with a pulse. And so, I guess it's not surprising that it's there. Um, we're, we're not sure how much it's contributing to the disease, but it is associated with root rot on pulses. And so um, because these pathogens can infect multiple crops, uh, crop rotation is, is, is difficult for this pathogen. But um, of course, you know, you want to focus on keeping that four year rotation for a phantomyces and then, um, you know, crop diversity is going to be your best bet um, in terms of not selecting one, one group that's highly aggressive on one specific crop. Uh, here I show hard red spring wheat ahead of, of the pulse, ahead of lentil. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen research that shows, uh, you know, whether durum or hard red spring wheat would be better. I just know we have better genetic resistance to head scab in the hard red spring weeds than we do in durum. And so perhaps that might help. Um, but this is just an example of, of what you might think about, at least in our growing region, um, for reducing issues with root rot. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms of, of seed treatments, for uh, managing this uh, disease. This is uh, data from the research center here in Williston, um, uh, one year of data. And so the, the two C treatments that are being compared are the uh, Allegiance plus Gaucho. So Allegiance is Malaxyl. So remember that's for the Pythium and the insecticide. So that shouldn't have activity on Fusarium root rot and then comparing it to Evergol Energy, which is a combination product of prothioconazole, pemflufen, and, and metalaxyl. So the metalaxyl is um, there too. And you can see there's a reduction in the incidence of root rot. So that's the number of plants where root rot symptoms are found, as well as the severity. Um, so that's the amount of the root system that's diseased. Um, however, we don't see a big impact on yield. Um, that's going to fluctuate by year, the return to yield, because a lot of things go into yield, uh, particularly rainfall, which is always uh, an issue here in Williston. Um, but um, that said, you know, fusarium can also infect season long, just like a vanomyces. And so the seed treatment is just going to protect um, during that initial parts of the season. Um, 
but you can see it does it does improve um, it does provide some benefit in terms of control of disease. Um, <clears throat> there's limit, limited genetic resistance available. Um, this is a study where these different P varieties were evaluated in the greenhouse. Um, they were challenged with Fusarium solani. Um, that's not a, a Fusarium species we find a lot in, in North Dakota, but it is a well-known Fusarium root rot pathogen. Um, and they did find some differences among the commercially available cultivars in disease resistance. Um, this is a root rot severity score that goes from zero to six. So zero is no disease at all. Six is essentially a dead plant. Um, and these are peas that have been inoculated. So um, they've been purposefully infected with the pathogen. Um, so the higher the score, the worse the disease. And you see nothing's at zero. So we don't have complete resistance, but some varieties here, like those ones in yellow, um, do a little bit better. Um, again, these are challenged in the greenhouse where Fusarium is the only pathogen. Uh, typically in the field, we see mixed infections. You might have some Pythium, you know, Aphanomyces, Rhizoctonia, all, all in there together. Um, but, you know, it, it can't hurt to, where, where you can select a variety that has a little bit of better tolerance to disease. All right, um, so this is data from a, a collaborative project with Michael Vonch. He spearheaded this effort to evaluate planting date for control of root rot, both for Aphanomyces and Fusarium. Um, and and the, the justification for this is that um, Aphanomyces and Fusarium like warmer soil conditions. You know, Pythium doesn't. It really does not like the, um, you know, Pyth Pythium likes the cooler temperatures. And so that's where sometimes you might hear, you know, if you're planting into cold soils, the pulses don't like that. But um, early planting is always gonna maximize yield, at least in our area because of the limited uh, rainfall, you know, uh, you plant earlier, you take advantage of that limited moisture. Um, but also we have seed treatments that are effective for Pythium. So if you're planting into a cold soil, you can take advantage of those products that are, that are really good at controlling Pythium. Um, and by early planting, you're avoiding planting um, into a soil where soil conditions are conducive for Aphanomyces and Fusarium. Um, so uh, here we're looking at uh, both root rot severity and yield by the different planting dates. And this is a trial I conducted here in Williston in 2018. Um, the higher the bar, um, the, either the higher the root rot severity, so that's the amount of the plant that's diseased, and, and the yield. And both, um, so the root rot severity increased uh, with later planting and yield decreased. So we do see a benefit to seeding early for control of, of root rot. And this was in, uh, in response to fusarium inoculation. And, and this was a trial I conducted in, uh, last year. This was in Granora in a, in a grower field where he had a history of a Phanomyces root rot. Um, I saw the same thing for management of the root rot disease. So the earliest planted um, peas had the highest, or sorry, had the lowest level of root rot severity, and the la and the second two dates had similar levels. I did not see a response in yield in that case, um, but we did have very little rainfall, and so that might have been our yield limiting factor um, in that case, rather than the disease. And in that case, I also noticed a little bit of frost issues. Um, seeding that early. So you kind of have to balance the agronomics with the disease management uh, based on, you know, the conditions in your fields, you know, have you noticed you're having a root rot problem. <clears throat> uh, and finally, uh, so we, we recommend these crop rotations, but we realize that it's important to have uh, research data to, to kind of put numbers to the benefit of a long term rotation. And um, so there have been, so I initiated a study here in 2018 um, and Michael Vunch also initiated some crop rotation research both in Carrington and Hedinger. Um, so I've got some uh, early data to show you from my study and some, um, he's had his study longer than me and I'll have some results on that. 
Um, so this field was was 2016, it was peas, and 2017, it was safflower. I have confirmed that there's a Phanomyces uh, present in this field, um, and there's uh, five different rotational treatments from, uh, you know, an every other year uh, with lentil and remember both lentil and NPs are susceptible to a phantomyces to, to a five year rotation. And the crops chosen for the rotation are based on, on crops that are in, in rotation with peas or lentils in our area. Um, and so we're trying to determine um, the effect of crop rotation length and, and, and in a couple of these rotation, you know, what what rotational crops you're using on root disease and lentil. And so this past year was, was the first year I was able to compare uh, different rotations. And so um, this would be years since uh, either peas or, or lentils were planted um, and uh, comparing a, a one year break to a three year break. Um, and I did see a decrease in, in root rot incidence. That's the number of plants that are um, that where root rot is present um, out of the ones we sample from the plots and um, and in the case of yield um, you know in terms of raw numbers it, it appears that the the three-year um, rotation might provide some benefit there um, again we were we were struggling with rainfall this season we were about four inches below normal um, so that's that's probably the main uh, factor contributing to our yield, and um, we'll continue to evaluate that um, over future years to kind of get an idea of how the yield is going to respond to that rotation length. Um, as I said, uh, this is a, a study uh, Michael Vunch is leading in collaboration with John Rickardson, who's the research agronomist at the Hedinger RIC, um, and so he's the two different sites have different field histories. So at Hedinger, he, he has detected a phantomyces, um, but there's no field pea production history prior to 2014. At the Carrington site, uh, is a long history of field pea production, um, and so, and, and root rot is known to be an issue in this field. Um, so he's comparing a, a two-year rotation, wheat and field pea, a uh, three-year rotation, uh, two years of wheat and field pea, and then a six-year rotation, uh, wheat, barley, canola, wheat, corn, field pea. Um, and this is data from, from 2020 across these, these treatments. And so um, in terms of the root rot, you can see um, where there's no history of, of field pea production, uh, you do see a response to um, the rotation. So even where it hasn't been in peas very long, uh, you see um, reduced root rot severity with the longer rotation. Um, not, a, not a big response in terms of yield. Um, again, uh, with time, with longer history of production of field pea, um, I might expect that to change. Because um, as you can see at the, at the Carrington site where you do have a long history of uh, field pea production and a presence of disease, um, a longer rotation does result in a yield benefit and um, reduced disease. And this is con in conjunction with early planting. So they did make sure to plant early as well. So to obtain the mo most benefit from a longer rotation, um, you want to plant early too. Um, so, you know, there are some management strategies for, for root rot. Um, it does mean that you need to invest some effort into to diagnosing, you know, what problem that you have. And um, that means digging up the roots and, and taking a look. Um, but in general, visual diagnosis is not going to be sufficient for you to determine what pathogen is present. I can't do that. <laughs> so I wouldn't expect anyone to be able to, um, you know, the, these roots right here, you know, maybe that looks a little bit of a, like a phantomyces, um, put them under the microscope and we didn't find any O spores. So it, it can be difficult to determine what you're dealing with. So, um, you know, you can send them to the diagnostic lab and essentially request that they culture what pathogen is there. That's how, typically how we detect it. Um, I don't know labs in, in the US where they're able to do the DNA testing on the roots. Um, those labs I discussed in Canada, um, the top one offers that. Um, 
if, if you're able to send them to them. Um, so plant testing uh, to diagnose your problem so you can manage it. Um, soil testing to predict risk before you plant. And then seed testing to make sure you're planting healthy seed, uh, give it the best chance against fighting these, these pathogens. Um, in the future, I think uh, soil testing is really going to help us uh, select field sites, but um, we need to get more tools. Um, this is a, an example of a project I was part of this past year where we took soil samples from different grower fields and they were sent to Australia, uh, a commercial um, uh, company there, Predictabee, offers this, um, this tool to measure the different amounts of these pathogens in the soil. So you can see the results of these fields. Um, and two of the fields, uh, we were they were able to detect the Phanomyces DNA. Uh, when I ended up calling these growers afterwards to discuss the results of their soil testing, uh, they both told me that they, they saw problems with root rot in the field. So the soil testing um, could be a really great tool um, in terms of tracking the pathogens and, and helping determine your risk. But, um, but we need to get more of those services in the US. Um, if you want to follow up, read more about um, the different diseases, um, we have an, a new dry pea and lentil root rot management guide from NDSU. Uh, this is on the web. Uh, you can also order printed copies. Um, and then the pea disease diagnostic series. Um, again, uh, lots of great pictures. Um, and uh, you. The, the hard copy of this is actually um, like a flip book where the paper is made of a field durable material. Um, if you're interested in getting some of those, um, I would suggest you, you talk to Ruth about that and she and I can work together to, to get some of these down into South Dakota. I know we've distributed, I think we distributed a few of them, um, but we can get some more printed as well. But both of these resources are available online. Um, and then uh, I encourage you to listen to the, the Growing Pulse Crops podcast. I, I can't take credit for uh, the, the quality of the episodes. Tim Hammerich is our host. Um, he's a professional podcaster. He does an excellent job. Um, and so, yeah, I've been really happy with how that's turned out. Um, this uh, podcast series is, is sponsored by the North Central IPM Center, uh, USD NIFA, and the USA Dry Pea and Lentil Council. Um, so, so that's all I have for you. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, is that what you would prefer? You want me to stop sharing my screen for questions or? Yeah, yeah, thanks Audrey. I think you can go ahead and, and do that and okay. then Ruth can get her stuff loaded up. Um, uh, thanks again, it was a lot of really great information and lots of uh, good resources as well. Um, just as a reminder, there's there's a Q and A uh, button down there on the bottom on the, the control panel down on the bottom of the screen, and then uh, there's also the the chat function if, if folks want to add comments or questions in there as well. Either will work. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and transition to some of the I, I think more of the above ground diseases that the foliar diseases uh, with uh, Ruth. So take it away, Ruth. Yeah, so you can see my screen, okay? My yeah, slides. It, yeah, yep, looks good. Okay, yeah, so um, thanks, Audrey. That was a, a great presentation, a lot of good information for us. So um, I'm just going to go through a few of the diseases that we commonly see in South Dakota each year, went for, um, you know, mostly here in the central part of the state. So this is a list of those diseases. We uh, annually see bacterial blight, powdery mildew can pop up fairly frequently. Pink seed is a very infrequency disease, but we do see it. And so I just want to mention that in passing. And then microspherial blight is the third, is the fourth disease that I'm going to talk about. So bacterial blight, um, it's a very common, it's a bacterial disease. It is transmitted by the seed. Um, it can colonize the plant without causing any symptoms. And really what we see with bacterial blight is we, as Audrey mentioned, these, these plants are often planted, uh, peas are often 
put in the ground fairly early like a spring wheat crop and what happens is the plant gets three to four inches tall and we get a late frost and we see these symptoms um, that you're seeing on this plant pop up. Uh, so it comes from mechanical damage to the plants when we start seeing the lesions. Um, it can occur on all the above ground parts of the plant. So the leaves, the stem, the tendrils, um, all can see these lesions. What I often see in South Dakota is we'll get um, a late frost and we'll see the bacterial blight affect the disease, the plant. But then as happens in South Dakota, the sun comes out, things get back to normal and the plant isn't severely damaged and it continues to grow and the new crop growth is very healthy. So, um, but the reason I mention it is, you know, it's really important to know what you're seeing out there because this is a bacterial disease. So spraying a fungicide isn't gonna do anything for you. Um, best thing to do is to watch those plants and, and if they start growing normally, um, they usually come right out of it. So uh, it's, it's one of those crop, one of those diseases. Just a few pictures I've taken over the years. Um, like I mentioned, it can happen on all parts of the plant. It can occur late in the season. Uh, we've seen that with the windstorm that came through a few years ago on June 20th one year and really impacted um, some of the plants. And so it gets on the pod um, like this and you really can't use those um, the, that seed for, for seed the next year because it will be carried on a seed coat. Make sure you're using clean seed with the, if you see this disease. Avoid those tight rotations like Audrey mentioned a number of times. Um, I have the opportunity to look at the variety trials across the state at times and how Chris does too. I know that sometimes it seems when we get a late storm that some varieties can be more susceptible than others to this disease. So that's something to remember. Again, just to mention, don't treat this with a fungicide. Um, hopefully your plants will grow out of it, especially if it occurs earlier in the, in its, in the plant's life versus later. The second disease I mentioned is powdery mildew. Um, Chris mentioned this yesterday. So this is um, where you see this kind of white fluffy growth on the plant. It's a very common fungal disease in peas. Um, it can decrease yields. It can um, result in smaller seed size. Uh, it can prematurely uh, mature the crop. And um, a lot of times it moves very fast through the crop and covers um, that powdery stuff, turns into kind of a dust and that can create a fire hazard at harvest. Um, so what you wanna do, when I look for this disease is when we have actually very good growing conditions, a year with very good growing conditions. So like 2020, we saw some really nice field pea crops in our area. Um, it's a late season disease. So it comes into the crop later in its life. And it often occurs when we get that very, you know, heavy canopy, um, it likes, semi-arid conditions, so dry days, cool nights, and heavy dews, which um, occur in, in our area. And um, that again, that heavy, very heavy canopy is when we can often see it. But it is also um, a function of the variety. So uh, with field peas, there are varieties that are resistant to powdery mildew. Um, and I think in Canada, they, they aren't even allowed to sell varieties that um, are not resistant to powdery mildew. So when people call me and ask me about varieties, I always tell them, look for a variety that has resistance to powdery mildew. But um, as with peas, you, you can't always get the variety that you want. A lot of times it's availability um, of those varieties. So sometimes people have to grow varieties that, have susceptible, that are susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, for one reason or another, sometimes I know I had a, a fellow here a couple of years ago um, that a company that was gonna buy his field piece from him requested that he grow a certain variety and that variety also was susceptible to powdery mildew. But that being said, it's very manageable disease. So um, again, when you get those conditions where we get that heavy canopy, cool nights, warm, dry days and dew, um, that's when you wanna be out there scouting those varieties. It is again, a late season, uh, comes in later in the life cycle of the piece. So, you wanna be scouting frequently once you start seeding the pods develop, if you're looking for this disease. 
The other thing you can do is make a, just go ahead and make a fungicide application, you know, based on those risk factors that I've talked about, whether, and if you have a susceptible variety, the right timing is for that spray application for this disease is mid to late pod fill. Um, Audrey mentioned uh, Dr. Michael Vunch out of North Dakota, and he's really the one that um, kind of taught me about this disease and, and what to tell, tell producers. And he recommended this mid to late pod fill. And if you can get that fungicide applied at the right time, one application should really almost take you to harvest. So that's that's the benefit of getting the right timing with that, that fungicide application. I just mentioned this last summer, um, I had a producer call me and he was growing a variety um, and it was kind of that timing for a, a fungicide application for powdery mildew prevention. And we visited on the phone and he, he said, I wasn't familiar with the variety he was growing but he said that the person who sold it to him told him it was resistant to powdery mildew. So I was inclined to tell him because I know that that resistance is quite good. I was inclined to tell him not to spray, but it was a nice day and I was kind of tired of being in the office. So I told him I'd go out and look at some of his fields. He had a lot of acres and I spent quite a bit of time out there. And I noticed that on some of the fields, very low in the canopy on the upside of the older leaves, I could find, I could detect some uh, of the beginnings of powdery mildew starting in some of his fields. So I told him that and we visited a little bit and because I wasn't familiar with the variety, um, I was afraid to tell him not to spray. And so he said he was gonna spray some of his fields. He made that decision. So I show you this picture because he sprayed half this field and he didn't spray the other half. And he said the difference was a 29 bushel difference in yield. Um, so, you know, make sure you know that variety is resistant. I really question whether this variety that he was growing actually was. And, and I also want to say that that's the nice thing about looking at the results of the variety trials that are done at SDSU that Chris performs every year because this variety had never been put in our variety trials. And um, when, when we see it in those variety trials, we know those varieties, we know how they perform. And a lot of times if we do get a lot of pressure from disease during a season, uh, I know Chris has done it, I've done it. We go out and we rate those varieties and see what we're seeing. So uh, just knowing your variety and who's selling it to you is important, I think, um, in this industry. I'm uh, just gonna briefly mention pink seed. We've, uh, it, this is an infrequent disease. It's a bacterial disease, um, but it causes this pink seed coat. And the reason I mention it is uh, because this is uh, not seed that you would want to replant into your field. And we have seen it more than a few times in South Dakota. So it does pop up, um, but it is sporadic. It's infrequent. Um, but one of the big reasons I also want to mention this is because pink seed can also impact wheat. So because we grow our field peas in uh, the wheat growing area of South Dakota, um, you know, when you're buying seed, that's something you want to watch for. If you see it in seed that you've grown, you probably don't want to reseed that, use that seed the next year. So again, just make sure when you, you know, with pink seed that you're um, using clean seed and you're avoiding those tight rotations with that, with those peas. The last seed uh, disease is that microsphorella blight of field peas. So um, this is caused by a complex of fungal pathogens. Again, this is a disease, I don't see it that much, um, but we have seen it occasionally in the state in pea crops. I did see it this past year and it, it does occur again in those conditions where we get you know, maybe humid conditions, a little bit wet. If you're familiar with peas, they get that great, you know, canopy, they kind of hold each other up, but it's tough walking through them. Um, that's when you can see this disease pop up. And um, one of the telltale signs is it causes these leaf lesions, but you'll see these concentric circles on the leaf and that'll indicate to you that it's um, this microsphorella blight occurring it can affect all portions of the plant. Um, it can impact yield. In the situation I saw last year, it came in fairly late into that crop. And so I, I didn't 
think I don't think that farmer ever did spray because it was late enough that he didn't think he'd see much of an impact um, in that crop. So just some things to be aware of. And then I just want to mention that we do have a, um, a site with a lot of information. We link into um, Audrey's podcasts are linked onto our web our website sdpulsegrowers.com. There are some YouTube videos linked in there that give you some information on planting. There's another YouTube video that's about harvest. We have our seed suppliers from our state listed there. And there's a lot of other good links there. We're linked into SDSU extension. So um, just some good information and a handy place to find it. In South Dakota, when it comes to plant disease, we don't really have a document that provides us with labels for fungicide applications. So I tell our producers here to use the North Dakota Field Crop Plant Disease Management Guide. Um, they've got a great, great information and it talks about which fungicides um, can be used and are effective on which diseases and it gives you the pre-harvest pre, um, intervals for all those fungicides. So that's a great um, source of information and, and I regularly refer to that during the season. We do have a P P I, uh, disease ID guide that we put together a few years ago. Um, I just want to mention that we have a plant pathologist at SDSU now. Her name is Dr. Fabina Matthew, and uh, she works a lot with the pulse crops and sunflowers. Uh, so she's been a great resource and also very helpful. So um, she's, if people have questions, either her or I are, are happy to answer those questions. So and that's my contact information. If anyone's got questions and I'm gonna stop sharing, that's my presentation, so. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, 